some of you know my wife Mary, uh, she's still back at the hotel and she said, why are they putting you on at 8.30? Nobody's going to show up. <laughs> this might be the first time I'm right about something. <laughs> I got married, so I hope somebody takes a picture of this crowd. Anyway, uh, a lot of exciting things going on. Um, a lot of things going on at the plant. Uh, it's kind of a renewal of Corvette. It's uh, really exciting to see it. A lot of it's uh, due to uh, how well the car has been accepted uh, by people like you and, and people really all around the world. So we're really appreciative of uh, where the Corvette um, community has uh, taken us. So I'm going to start with the year in review. Um, starting from a little over a year ago, uh, when we introduced the Grand Sport, this is in Geneva, Switzerland. So we're truly an international brand, uh, recognized all around the world, uh, decided to uh, reveal the Grand Sport uh, relatively early uh, in the life cycle, and a lot of that had to do with customers uh, like you guys, uh, knowing that we did the Grand Sport on the sixth generation car, and uh, really liking that combination, and uh, basically asking for it from the moment we brought out the seventh generation car. And so uh, we brought it out relatively early. Uh, Oliver Gavin and I uh, did the honors in Geneva, and it was pretty, uh, it was really fun because we kind of stole the show, and uh, there's a lot of really premium cars uh, introduced to Geneva. It's a very high-end show, a lot of very expensive cars, and uh, there's a lot of like big, big all-new uh, reveals there, and uh, our little brand sport kind of took the thunder away from uh, some very prestigious marks uh, in, on their home turf. So that was uh, very exciting to do, and very exciting to see the, the reaction that we got. And then truly, you know, we spent a lot of uh, last year introducing the car uh, to media, letting them experience it. And I don't think I read uh, one review that wasn't just glowing. Uh, people really, really liked the car. Uh, we did an organized event. We actually had Oliver uh, back at uh, the press event uh, showing people how to drive and uh, showing what the car could do. And then we let people have the car uh, to put it up against whatever they wanted to put it up against. So uh, Carbon Driver. Um, you know, really, really like the car. They, they talked about it being a sweet spot. And really, if you, if you read all of these, it almost seems like this is the only Corvette to get. Uh, but they make it sound that way because it's really important to sell uh, magazines and bring uh, eyeballs to websites and stuff. So it's the latest and greatest thing. And we really believe it's the latest and greatest thing. But it's no disrespect uh, to a Stingray or a Z06. Uh, those are both awesome cars appealing in a slightly different way. Uh, to different customers. Road and track, uh, east we go fast, but not in a passive way a GTR does, so kind of automated. Uh, this is no video game. The GTS is, uh, it is the Grand Sport GS is familiar and accessible in the right way. Top Gear, so internationally, this is the BBC, uh, European Top Gear. Uh, what's it like to drive? Instantly fun. Should I buy one? Unreserved, yes. And that was kind of a uh, conclusion, like a bottom line, uh, from a bunch of uh, media. Uh, next one, Ars Technica. Should you buy one? The answer, we think, is a resounding yes. So uh, a lot of coaching uh, out there uh, helping us uh, sell cars. Uh, Grand Sport, here's road and track. Uh, jump up to the Grand Sport is absolutely uh, worth it. And uh, a lot of the feedback I get is, the Grand Sport is a car that you never feel like uh, you have too much car. It's got incredible chassis capability, chassis capability you can use on the road, and still enough horsepower to keep it really entertaining. Motor Trend, uh, for a little more money than the base Stingray, you can have your dream Corvette that you can drive to the grocery store, a racetrack, a fancy restaurant, to a religious gathering of your choosing. <laughs> Insert religion here. Um, it can be your daily driver and your Sunday fun day car, need I say more. And we talk a lot in here about bandwidth, trying to make cars that can do a lot of different things uh, well, so it can fit into a lot of different lifestyles. And a review like that warms our hearts because it means the journalists really appreciate what we're trying to do. Then you get down to the nuts and bolts, kind of the, you know, how did it really perform? Uh, road and track, uh, performance car of the year, they got all the hottest cars. Uh, new to the market, on track, and uh, see what they could do with them. Uh, the Porsche 911 Turbo S, so that's 
the turbo, that's a Turbo S. That's a little more horsepower. That's about a $200,000 car. Uh, beat us by nine one hundredths of a second. Uh, that's all wheel drive. Uh, Porsche obviously is an extremely capable car manufacturer and uh, we're way more than double the price. Uh, they beat us by nine one hundredths of a second. And you can see the other, like the NSX guys have to be really happy that their brand new car, supercar, uh, came out uh, behind us along with the GTR Nismo. So that's the hottest uh, GTR you can buy. So those are some cars with some real um, track cred, and uh, our brands for uh, put them back in the pit. So really happy uh, with that kind of performance. And part of that is because it is really easy to drive and you hand the keys to somebody, especially the media, you're never quite sure who's going to be driving it. Um, and so it can be people of extremely high skill. Sometimes they bring in a hot shoe like Andy Pilgrim or somebody. Um, sometimes that's it, one of the editors, usually very capable drivers, but maybe not right at the leading edge. So if the car is a quick learn um, beyond what it's ultimately capable of in a pro hands, um, if it's a quick learn in a, a quick shot like this, you give somebody the keys, they take a bunch of cars to track. If it's easy, accessible performance, that ends up uh, showing in the final results. Motor trend, head-to-head uh, -head here. Uh, extremely uh, competitive with the, the 911. So this is the best driving Corvette yet built. Borderline magic, they call it. Only problem, this is, this is great, I'm sure Porsche Club this too. The only problem is that I'd be daydreaming of driving the Grand Sport while I'm out grocery shopping in the Porsche. <laughs> Just get the Grand Sport, it's easy. Which is the better sports car? The answer by almost a second uh, in this was the Grand Sport beating the 911 by 0.82 seconds. Uh, here's Auto Guide, Reader's Choice, um, another selection, Grand Sport sports car uh, of the year. 10 best, uh, we fell off 10 best uh, for a brief period and it almost never happens that, uh, you know, because they love everything that's kind of shiny and new, it almost never happens that if you're on 10 best and you fall off, you get back on 10 best with essentially the same car. The Grand Sport uh, was so compelling that it, it brought us back to uh, 10 best at, uh, car and driver. And then uh, same thing actually with Consumer Reports recommended by, I know a lot of people don't pick themselves consumer reports when deciding to buy a Corvette, but it's nice to have kind of a mainstream uh, media quality assessment uh, organization uh, put their stamp of approval on you. And how many people saw this at the uh, auto show this year? Yeah. Yeah. A few people? Okay, this is not a political gathering, so we're not going to talk politics. <laughs> But uh, just by coincidence, I was at the auto show, and you can tell it's a coincidence because I'm dressed like a slob and everybody else is really nicely dressed. I had no idea this was going to happen. I was actually down at the Detroit Auto Show for uh, completely another meeting, and I noticed there was an uh, unusual number of bomb-sniffing dogs uh, walking around. <laughs> you don't usually see a lot of uh, German Shepherds at the auto show, but there was quite a few uh, down there. And so I was kind of cruising around, actually was headed over, I wanted to look at the Ford GT and see if I could sit in it and see if it was real. And I, uh, <laughs> so uh, I, uh, on my way over there, I happened to run into one of our communications guys and he, he said, uh, you know what's happening? I was like, no, what's happening? He goes, well, Joe Biden's coming over to check out uh, Corvettes and other Chevrolets. And so I said, oh, that's cool. I said, can I watch? And uh, he's like, yeah, stand over there, stand over there. And so uh, there's a huge crowd because everybody knew uh, he was coming. And uh, Mark Royce, you can see over uh, Joe's shoulder, uh, showed up. And, uh, and I was talking to him a little bit. I said, that's great, you're going to show uh, Joe around. He goes, yeah, stick by me, stick by me, I'll introduce you. And so uh, I tried to do that. And uh, as he got closer, he was coming from the Ford exhibit and he was surrounded by about 250 media, and then layers of security, event police, Detroit police, Secret Service, these waves of security were kind of leading the way through the crowd. And I had no ID, I had no badging, I had no credentials, I had no, I didn't look like I belonged there. And um, so I'm trying to figure out how to get through the security uh, and 
trying to stand by the Corvette and, and hold my ground because I knew he was going to show up with the Corvette. And so I, uh, I'm standing there and this giant cop comes up and says, sir, you have to move aside. And I didn't know what to say, so I just said, uh, I just blurted out, I just said, well, I'm part of the show. And I, he goes, well, why didn't you just say so? so I thought, oh. Man, that's, that's tight security for you. So anyway. So um, the whole crowd, you know, the media scrum uh, headed this way, and, and Mark Roy saw me and kind of pulled me in. Um, and we just started talking about the car, and then Joe got in the car, and Mark said, why don't you get on the other side? And uh, so I jumped in the passenger side, we shut the doors, windows up, sealed out everybody else, and had uh, about five minutes uh, with the vice president just to chat cars. And um, I've walked a lot of politicians around the auto show, and I have to say, uh, Joe was unique in my experience. Uh, he was a car guy first and a politician second. Uh, usually the politicians are, they know where every camera is, they know the shot they want, they're positioning themselves, it's like a, a photo op. You know, I care about this, I care about the industry, you know, it comes off when you're like right there with them, it comes off kind of fake. Joe didn't hear anything about any of that. He was going off script constantly, you know, he's supposed to go from here to there, he's like, forget you guys, I'm, I'm going to stand here and, and talk to my buddies on uh, Corvette. So, really, really uh, cool experience, and uh, to me, he came off, uh, you know, as basically one of us, uh, a real car person. Uh, I really enjoyed that, and he, he did say, you know, he was, he was struggling with, oh, I'm going to be out of office, I'm going to be able to, you know, be able to actually drive myself, I'm not going to be chauffeured everywhere, he goes, what do I get, do I get, do I get a Stingray, you know, because he has a Corvette, he has, uh, I think it's a 67, if I remember right, and uh, it's just like, oh, I, I'd really love to have another Stingray in the driveway, and he goes, but this is for this is so sweet, he goes, but i got to drive this EO6, you know, i got to check that out, so he was really struggling. Uh, with his personal uh, car decision and, and spending all the time uh, with us, uh, basically, to try to work that out in his head. So anyway, um, I offered my help at any time, you know, after he's out of office to, to get him into one. I haven't heard back from him, though. I'm sure he's uh, resting and relaxing after getting out of office. So. Is that him one of each? <laughs> Suggestion up here is uh, suggest, send, them, send him one of each. Well, we're not sending him anything. <laughs> can pay like all good red blood in America. <laughs> anyway, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the race season uh, last year. You know, we uh, certainly had our challenges. It's never easy. Uh, how many of you were at the race dinner last night? And you guys go? Was it good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, you heard from those guys. They probably uh, showed you some similar things. Uh, I think they're going to be around today. Around today, you talk to them some more. Anyway, awesome effort as always. Um, they leave it all on the field uh, every year. And when you hear some of the stories behind the scenes and some of the things they had overcome, you know, in the end, if you just kind of look at the highlights of the season, then it make it look easy, but it's not easy uh, by any means. And, and some of the struggles they go through to, to achieve the results for all of us is really, really impressive and inspiring. So that was last year. And then uh, this year we're off to a uh, pretty good start. Um, oh, I forgot to mention the 100 wins. Yeah, talk about uh, an amazing milestone, uh, getting to 100 wins. Uh, most race programs are lucky to run in 100 races. You know, they usually don't last. You know, somebody uh, gets the idea, let's go racing, it'll help promote the brand. They race for a couple of years and then it's discontinued. It's expensive, it's hard. It's hard to be uh, consistently winning. If you're not winning, why participate? So uh, it's a tough sell. And so to be in it long enough, consistently enough, and uh, as competitive as we've been for as long as we've been to 100 wins is uh, really, really impressive. And then immediately we're on 101, 102, 103. So uh, I don't know if we'll make it to 200, at least not while I'm still at GM, but uh, I'd love to love to see the, the successes they're having. So anyway, started off uh, pretty decently uh, this year and it's going to be just like last year. It's going to be hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat uh, all the way through the season. Uh, challenges with the balance of performance, trying to figure out the best way uh, to bring home the, the victories. But they're super inspired to do it uh, for you guys, for us uh, on the program, on the, on the vehicle side. And I couldn't be happier with uh, the partnership that we have with Pratt Miller and Corvette Racing. 
Okay, so that's kind of the highlights uh, from the last year. Uh, I'm going to bring Carl up next uh, to talk a little bit about uh, sales and some other information that's new. Carl? data part of the presentation where we get to look at all the all the numbers and everybody likes that. So but it actually you know as we're talking about racing, you know we compete in the showroom, I would say that, with all the cars that we race against and more. And this is the biggest uh, victory we have is being the number one uh, luxury sports car segment, you know, almost uh, forty percent market share and um, market's a little bit down from last year, but overall we're still uh, dominating as usual. And outselling by far all the Porsche entries and everybody else. Uh, this is um, data. If you see, uh, we got Wendy Whitmiller here, and she puts together all this data for us. That's a good job. Um, this is looking at, uh, this is at, as of uh, pretty much at now April 4th. So we're getting you know close to all the orders in for 2017. Uh, and you can see that the new Grand Sport was 38% of the total Corvette did really well. That's, that's probably about, about what we thought, so we're really happy with that. And you can see uh, Z06 had a little bit of a later start, but still uh, rebounded very strong uh, with uh, the Z06. And you can see, um, you know, it's kind of as, as you expect as we go up from Stingray to Grand Sport to Z06, you see the different trim levels, one, two, three, it seems to go up as you go up, so it kind of makes sense. Uh, this is some of the Stingray data. You can see um, the eight-speed uh, automatic transmission, paddle shift, over 80%. So it really keeps going up and up. Uh, and uh, the chassis, so we actually have four different possible uh, chassis with the Stingray. You have, you have the standard, you have magnetic ride, you have Z51, and Z51 with magnetic ride. And actually, it's now that the standard chassis is the most popular. A lot of people get the performance exhaust and uh, red brakes are popular, and black wheels continue to be to be, more, be popular on all the Corvettes. I see on the Grand Sport, uh, also almost 80% uh, eight-speed uh, paddle shift. Um, one of the cool things, uh, again, red brakes, almost half of the cars have the red brake option. Uh, the Z15, that is our heritage package. Of course, they have, you know, the hash mark stripes and the interior. Uh, package that goes together. About a third of the Grand Sports had the uh, Heritage package, that's pretty good. And about 20% had the Center Stripe too, so a lot of people having fun with all our, we're hoping when people would do that, you know, all the different combinations and things we introduce, uh, that people would really personalize their cars. Again, Black Wheels, also very popular. And then, then we get to the Z06, uh, of course. Um, and even even on Z06, 70, 71% eight speed paddle shift, also very popular. About a third of the cars had the Z07 package, and then the 18% of people are starting, um, you can get the uh, ceramic ring package without the Z07. So that's, already, that's gone up quite a bit as well. And colors are always fun to look at colors. Art of White continues to be uh, number one for quite a while, but really uh, the new Watkins Glen Gray really did well, the second highest color was black and torch red are always uh, mainstream colors too, very, very high. And the new Admiral Blue did well also. Interiors, of course, you know, you can't go wrong with jet black, but the adrenaline red would be the, the number two interior. Now this is like, we can, so you can look at this later, but we do get to put this data together. Um, it's kind of fun to see all the interior, exterior combinations. Like, like let's just take for example, like Ryan has a silver Stingray with Kalahari interior. That was nine, nine cars, yellow brake, so he's got a very rare car. Like, you know, it's, fun to, it's fun to look at the different, the different com combinations and see, um, and see what they are. So we've got some rare ones, of course, usually one of the more popular ones, of course, the, the white with the red interior is always pretty high and uh, things like that. So. One of the things we uh, were very proud of was the collector edition. Uh, we, we are pretty close to our limit of 1,000. 
This data goes goes up to um, 926. I think we're actually have orders in for nine. I think we're at 970 something as of now. So we're going to get pretty close to the to the thousand. So this car, um, despite having a little bit of a late start in the year, has been a big hit. We're really uh, pleased with how it how it did. And you see, uh, only uh, of the uh, 926 first ones, 150 were convertible, so mostly coupes. Uh, and as you can see, mostly towards the eight speed and the competition seats, 266 and 926. So it kind of keeps some of the data, you know, on the special editions too for everybody. All right, what's new for 2018? I'm going to have the kick this off. Uh, we weren't happy with the, you know, the, the reception and how that's doing. So we, we, we 
upgraded uh, some of the antennas and everything like that, so we're able to bring back uh, the HD radio feature. On the performance data recorder, how many people know about the performance data recorder? Okay. So performance data recorder um, is great. The basic uh, onboard car data recorder is the same, but what we were able to do uh, for the Cosworth toolbox is add a few extra channels. So um, for 18, if you run the toolbox, you'll have, you can get some cool things like all four individual wheel speeds, the suspension displacements, the yaw rate, and intake, and ambient air temperatures. So if you can't live without that, you gotta get it. <laughs> also, uh, we've improved the rear view camera. It's a uh, better resolution, much improved. And uh, the head up display, um, this is kind of an interesting one. Most people will never use this feature, but some people, you know, it's one of these things, do you want the head up display to line up to the world? Do you want to line up to the hood? We have people, you know, debating that. So if you feel it's a little bit off, you can now rotate it. Make, make it however you like it. Come on, really, Harlan? Really? Really? Wow. Wow. You guys are awesome. We're awesome. So for 2018 um, Stingray, um, you know, we've done a lot. We haven't done a lot for the Stingray since it came out, uh, you know, separately. And so this was a good year to upgrade the Stingray model, and, and we've done that. We've actually, the Stingray now comes standard with the 19 inch front, 20 inch rear wheels. Previously, you had to upgrade to Z51 uh, to get. And the other thing we've done is we added a lot of uh, more wheel options that will go to in, in a minute that you can get. So um, hold off on that. Also on the Z06, we've added more wheel options. We've added an additional stripe color for the Grand Sport Heritage. And then we have our new color that you can see outside. We're going to talk about the ceramic uh, matrix gray, which is a very light gray with a metallic with the blue blue highlights and that replaces the sterling blue color from 2017 and then we also have the uh, spice that convertible top which used to be only packaged with that interior it's, it's a top color that you can just get as an option so getting back to the stingray so on any stingray even with, without z51 you can you can get of course you get the standard sterling silver but now we have all these wheel choices that you can get so we think it's kind of exciting, you know, for not, um, for kind of a, not a high price, you can get a really uh, neat looking stick ready with, with special wheels. Of course, we have the, the black machine, the chrome, we have red stripe and yellow stripe, you know, some of those outside. We have the torque design wheels, again, available from the factory, and the motorsport design wheels available from the factory. So you can just check the box and get these now, and they stick ready. On the Grand Sport, and we continue with the five uh, wheel options. And then on the Z06, we added the red stripe. We added for 17. We added, you can get the yellow stripe wheel, and then you can, you can get the pearl and nickel uh, blade wheel as well. Again, these are our uh, 10 colors available. You can see at the bottom is the new uh, ceramic matrix gray. Okay, and uh, we got Ryan here, so let him uh, go over all the new interior changes. So this is kind of a, an overview of, of what's going on, and I'll take you through the details. Uh, one thing that changes is uh, the color breakup on a 2LT. So you can see in this schematic that uh, kind of purple color shows where the contrast in color is on all of our different interior breakups, um, which we have quite a few of. And what we're trying to do is make things actually simpler and more consistent. So. Uh, currently, you know, just taking adrenaline red as an example, but it uh, works the same with all the contrasting colors. Uh, in from model year 14 to 17, if you've got a 2LT Stingray, or a, in this case a Grand Sport, uh, you get the adrenaline red seats and contrasting adrenaline red armrests on the doors of the console. For model year 18, the Batwing, the driver's side cockpit shape, also goes in that contrasting color. So this is how a Z06 worked, uh, and now we're making the, uh, the other cars, the Stingray and the Grand Sport, uh, consistent with that. So it'll make it a lot more simple. Um, the color walk up as you go from like a one to a two to a three now works the same across uh, all three models. 
the uh, accent stitch packages are being enhanced for um, Auto Gear 18. So in this case, uh, on the leather car, so black leather, uh, you can get an accent stitch package, uh, and of course the gray, uh, red, yellow, and uh, now blue. So you can get a blue accent stitch package. The uh, paddles on the steering wheel are still red or yellow. You get the red or yellow stitch package. Uh, this also uh, comes with the FAY low gloss uh, carbon fiber trim on the IP. And the black suede packages are enhanced as well. So this is a black uh, leather interior with black suede on the seat inserts, the door armrests, and those cockpit shapes on the instrument panel and doors. And that now comes in that the same selection of stitch colors. So gray, which we had before, uh, now red, yellow, and the blue stitch paddles matched with the red and yellow stitch. And this also comes with the carbon fiber steering wheel. So this is a new feature for Model Year 18. We've got a carbon 360 degree wrapped carbon fiber rim on the steering wheel. So the upper and lower segments are fully carbon fiber. Uh, it's a high gloss. And so this package comes with the FCC high gloss uh, carbon fiber IP trim as well as metal. So this is, a, this is a detail showing that interior and each of the stitch colors. So the gray, the red, yellow, yellow panels, and the blue. And the carbon fiber wheel is, is a really neat feature. Um, it, it has a very kind of exotic, sporty look to it. Um, it also comes in suede, by the way, so you've got kind of that high gloss carbon and the low gloss suede with the stitch, excess stitch color on it. It's, it's really cool. And with that, I will hand it back to Arnold. You know what this is? <laughs> 65 years of Corvettes on one slide. So our 2018 is our 65th year. So we were thinking, you know, uh, 65 anniversary, you know, like um, like 25th was like silver, you know, and 50th is gold. Like what is 65? We didn't really know, so we decided just to decree that the 65th anniversary of Corvette is the carbon fiber anniversary. So that's why we did the carbon edition. So the, the Carbon 65 edition, um, the code for that is the Z30, no we have a couple of code. And um, it's going to be available, uh, it's available to start of production, and um, you see, everybody seen the cars here that we have? Almost everybody. So you can get it on a, a Z06, a 3LZ, Cooper convertible, or a Grand Sport uh, 3LT Cooper convertible. So you get on, on either of those cars. And um, it has the new color. You know, it is limited to, it has its own, we're going to have our own VIN to count these, and interior black to count these. And it is limited to 650 globally. So it's a very limited uh, production. So it'd be around 450 for the US and 200 export ish around there. Um, it does have uh, unique graphics. Um, it has unique wheels with a machine groove, uh, uh, brake calipers, and we put basically all the carbon fiber uh, options that we have today and created some new ones as well. So you get the carbon fiber hood, carbon fiber ground effects, um, carbon fiber interior, the steering wheel like Ryan talked about. The, uh, then we have for new, new that we haven't done before, we have carbon fiber spoiler. Uh, on these cars, the carbon fiber co rear quarter uh, intakes. And we have the interior with the uh, some of the, here's, uh, some of the uh, shots that we uh, released recently of the cars. Z06 Coupe. Now the two that we have here, we know these are the only two that exist as of right now. We have a Z06 Coupe. And the only real options are we get the transmission and the Z07 package is an option or ceramic link option. Otherwise, it comes with every, everything else. And then we have the Grand Sport convertible here as well. There's the Grand Sport convertible. Now, these are uh, Kirk Bengen will be here later, our exterior design manager. These are some of his early sketches they put together. And this is the uh, this is the Grand Sport version. You can see um, this is 
good. His early sketches decided, you know, how to do the, um, the graphics. And one of the graphics, too, it's kind of subtle, but I think a lot of people will like it on the coupe. You can see the graphic with the gloss black. It connects the carbon fiber to the rear window. It kind of creates that graphic. I think it, it really gives it a nice, a nice look. And here's the Z06 version. All right, here's some of the details. Uh, again, the wheels, uh, the Grand Sport gets uh, cup wheels with the machine groove, and the uh, Z06 version gets the, what we call the blade wheels, again, black with machine groove. There's special silk blades. Uh, those are the, for the first time, we have these carbon fiber uh, quarter ducts. We have the uh, blue brakes and accents, which brings out the blue highlights in the color, and the carbon uh, logo on the wheel caps. Of course, fender graphics and the new uh, carbon uh, rear spoiler. Okay, let's get right back to talk about the carbon 65 interior. Okay, a lot of games. Um, so the carbon 65, uh, as Harlan said, obviously the emphasis on carbon fiber, it's a very, uh, it gives the car kind of a very serious feel to it. So we use the uh, black leather and black suede interior for this car. Uh, so the suede uh, break up with the suede cockpit seats. Um, it's got the competition seats in as well, and the blue stitch to tie into the uh, to the exterior uh, color, uh, stripe color. So we've also got the carbon fiber rim steering wheel with the blue stitching suede wheel. The uh, FCC high gloss carbon fiber IP trim as well because the wheels are high gloss, so they have to match. Uh, the new combination of black leather, black suede, and blue stitch. And we've got a heat box as well. Uh, one of the things that we're doing here that uh, we're trying to get a little bit better about is uh, typically when we do a, a special edition, we do a special edition plaque for the IP. And then that's, that's the identity of that plaque. So um, if you get a Grand Sport or if you get a Z06, um, you don't get a Grand Sport or a Z06 plaque, you get a special edition plaque. So in this case, we're combining them. So if you order a Grand Sport, you get a Grand Sport plaque, but it's carbon 65, so it has carbon 65 on it, and it's got the build number, so you're not your build number out of 650 total. Same thing for, for Z06, so you can still get a Z06, if you order a Z06, you get a Z06 plaque, but it's a carbon 65 Z06 plaque, so you don't lose the identity of the, of the vehicle itself. So. Another hand off the back. <laughs> Well, you guys can, uh, can come back up, actually. Um, that's kind of the end of our uh, prepared uh, presentation today. But um, I hope you can see, even though you know we've got the paint shop going, a lot of renewal going, uh, we're still trying to bring out uh, new stuff uh, for you all. Uh, even though 65 to a lot of people means uh, retirement age, for us it's a new beginning. We're, we're just getting rolling, and we want to keep rolling and uh, keep bringing out uh, new stuff that will uh, keep the whole Corvette community alive and interested in, uh, in our products. And so uh, we'll be back again next year and for the foreseeable future, uh, bringing new stuff to you. So that's it for today. But uh, we're happy to take uh, questions and answers. We've got quite a lot of time here. We'd be happy to entertain them. You guys can come up to All right, who's got the first question? You know what? We always start in the front. Let's start from the back. <laughs> Go ahead. The question is, can you update the PDR software? To, we get this question every year, and honestly, I don't know. And the answer is, as usual, no. No, sorry. Because <laughs> a lot of times there's hardware and software that get those together, and so I talked about this. You know, we could uh, decide we want everything to be back serviceable and not change the hardware, but it would limit the amount of improvement that we could make. And so, uh, we, in general, we say, you know what, we're not going to let back serviceability uh, keep us from making the, the feature or the car as good as it can be. Okay. Thank you. Uh, considering.
the penetration of the eight-speed automatic uh, in the portfolio, uh, I, I would request that you never consider removing the manual. We don't have a question, we have a demand. <laughs> The demand is that we never remove the, the manual transmission. It has. Yeah. For all of you that are clapping, I assume you all own a current manual transmission. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your business. Would it be okay? Let me ask you a question. Would it be okay if the automatic became standard and we charged you a nominal leg for you? Getting a mixed response from The answer is yes. For him, it's yes. Okay. All right. But we we, we hear you. <laughs> okay. Another question. Dan. So there's a giant new building over there, and the question is, what percentage of it is paint shop? And the answer is 100. 100 percent. You don't believe me, you're laughing at me, but uh, would I lie to you? In this case, I'm not lying to you. It is 100% a paint shop, and we will have uh, videos, actually, video tours, and we hope long term for the first time uh, public tours, when we get the tours going again, the paint shop's online, up and running, we have thought about it. It's the only time in history, in EM history, we said, you know, what if we could bring uh, people who are touring the plant through the paint shop? Typically, you can't do that because it's a clean room environment. Uh, you have to go undergo a bunch of testing. You can't use deodorant. There's all sorts of things. You cannot go in the paint shop without all sorts of uh, unusual prep. Uh, so it's a closed area. But we have tried to orchestrate uh, places where you can peek in and windows where you can look in and see it, so I'm hoping to show that. But uh, like I said, it's because it's custom designed for composite panels, the paint ovens are enormously long, just incredible. And we space the panels out on what we call a scuff, that's a fixture that holds all the panels in position for the robots to paint. It's as big as a Suburban, so you essentially have a Suburban going through the paint shop very slowly, and it's going through at low temperatures. Uh, because that doesn't disturb the composite. So believe it or not, and I know people probably won't believe me, uh, but it, it's true. The paint shop, what you see, that whole building is all dedicated to paint. I believe you. <laughs> I don't believe me. He's been there. We've walked through it. It's true. It's true. Uh, all dedicated to paint. OK, way in the back. Here. Next question. <laughs> The question was, how far away is the C8? It's uh, definitely in the future. So, <laughs> just keep coming to the bash well, year after year after year, well, and eventually uh, there will be a C8 we can talk about. Okay. You asked a question already. <laughs> I'm right behind you. Back to you. Here. Look, another question about future product. He's asking about uh, ZR1. Obviously, we can't talk about any future product, uh, any future models. We're talking about 2018 today. And like I say, just keep coming back here. And, uh, if we do have things to announce, we'll talk about them in detail here. Way back. The blue. Go ahead. I think the question was around why do we get rid of the 18 and 19? We, we, we found that, you know, uh, early on, you know, that everybody loved the, the larger wheels on the Corvette. We just thought it would be a great way to upgrade the Stingray. You know, we've been out for, this is our fifth year now. We wanted to really upgrade the appearance and make it uh, a little bit more affordable for people to get a, a car that doesn't look like a base car, that looks like an up-level car standard. And, and honestly, uh, my father's an example of this. He bought a Z51 not because he was going to track it, because he wanted the big wheels. So, you know, he could get whatever he wanted. He just liked the big wheels. So now he has all the other content that he doesn't need as part of Z51. He's got more aggressive brakes, so more brake dust. 
So if he's trading one problem for another, he'd much rather have what we're now offering, big wheels, but the standard brake. So really it's a uh, customer pull. And you know how much extra it costs? $45. <laughs> We'll get to it. Okay, in the blue now. The question is, uh, the carbon 65, are we going to produce them all before the shutdown? We'll produce them to order. If we get enough orders of customers who want them before shutdown, we can produce them before shutdown. But we'll be able to continue uh, producing them after shutdown if people still want it. I don't right. think so. I think that we'll, we won't go back in before shutdown, most likely. Yeah, yeah, most likely. There'll be, some, there'll be a good portion. We want to get as many as we can before, but there'll be some after. Go ahead. We usually don't try to predict volumes. You know, it's just, it's a losing battle. Sometimes we make more than we expect, sometimes less. You know, the plant's essentially rated at the capacity that we've been producing, but we can fluctuate up and down uh, to meet market demand, whatever that is. Typically at this time in the program, you know, we were introducing car in 14, now we're starting our 18th, so fifth model year. You typically see a, a product like the Corvette, you know, it's very hot for a few years, you see the volume taper off. So we plan for that kind of volume decay. Uh, it's not really a big deal. The question was also about, uh, are we delaying new models because of the shutdown? The answer to that is no. Uh, we are trying to make sure that the plant has a minimum amount of churn while they go through this process. So changing the car like in, during model year 18, like right before the shutdown, or right after, we're not doing much of that. But there would not be a change in major model uh, for deals or delivery or anything because of that. Question is 100 octane cal uh, available for uh, transport. I do not believe we have any plans to do that. It's not really necessary. Okay. George, you have a question? Do you have any chance for twin clutch manual transmission? Asking about, uh, you want a DCT manual transmission? Yeah. You just want a DCT. Yeah. Why do you want it? Sophistication of this. Well, this this car, you know, we got the two transmission choices. Uh, we're really lucky. You know, you've asked a question about the manual before. Uh, many people are walking away from that and just offering a, a single transmission. Uh, we're happy that we can do the seven-speed manual, the eight-speed automatic. Uh, typically, doing an all-new transmission. Uh, there, there's not a, a DCT that exists in the world that will plug and play into this car. Can't take the power, can't take the torque, won't fit in a package, uh, and you know we can't do a unique transmission uh, just for Corvette. Other questions? Yeah, the white back here. Something about C7 of the race car or the. Oh, okay. Um, well, when we introduced the Stingray, we talked a lot about that, how the uh, C6R uh, introduced or generated a lot of ideas on design innovation. And that's why we have like the rear quarter ducts and the dip and trans cooler in the back, whereas they'd always been in the front. And we have the pathway that goes through the top of the quarter and, and out the back of the car. So we're always looking to take the race car solutions and see if we can apply them. Uh, it really goes both ways. We try to make a better street car that's more applicable, a better starting point uh, for the race car. So now that the C7R is out there, and has been out there for a few years, we're staying really, really tight uh, with the race team to see what uh, of any of the technology advancements uh, they're using we can apply to future Corvette models. So that, that's kind of an ongoing thing. If you hear Doug Behan talking about it, he talks about it as cascade engineering. Race car helps street car get better, better street cars, better starting point for a race car. That race car is more competitive, makes more advancements, which then goes right back to the street car. We've been doing that now uh, for generations of Corvette, and it's going to continue. Yes, sir? Question is about the 10 speed automatic that's uh, recently been introduced in the Camaro. Uh, that transmission does not fit in a Corvette. That transmission was um, basically a paper study when we were uh, starting the, the development work on the seventh generation car. And so none of the Corvette requirements, which the main ones are around packaging, uh, were applied to that transmission. And 
So it's that we don't see that transmission going into the Corvette. And in fact, uh, eight speeds is a lot. When I first started, we had a four speed automatic and everybody thought that was awesome. And uh, then we went to the six speed and honestly, in engineering, we thought, wow, six speeds. We're never gonna want more than six speeds. You got a really flexible engine, it's got a lot of low end torque. There's a point where the car spends all its time shifting and not driving. And so um, we're getting to the point that people are talking crazy numbers uh, of transmission speeds, and uh, it eventually evolves into not a technical requirement, but a marketing one. It's one up and shift. You know, does your transmission have more gears in mind? So uh, there, there's come to a point of diminishing returns in terms of number of ratios in the transmission. And more ratios means bigger box, more money, more complicated, more mass. So uh, there's some downsides to that escalation as well. What, any more than that? Yes, ma'am. Question about accident prevention technology? Okay. Um, so uh, you see a lot about autonomous and starting to take the responsibility of driving away from the driver. Uh, there's a big move afoot. You know, people are doing adaptive cruise control now and, uh, you know, lane assist and all this stuff that uh, essentially reduces the workload for the drivers to spend more time texting. And so, uh, we, you know, we're kind of the antithesis of that. We assume you buy this car because you enjoy driving it. And so we try to provide all the information you need as the driver uh, to do the right thing. Um, you know, we have heard uh, requests. We brought the car out uh, for side blind zone because other Chevrolet products have it. Uh, thought about that. It's really hard in this architecture because we have big heat exchangers in the back door quarters where the sensors go. And um, so we take that input in, and we're not going to be the people who you know, are moving as far to the extreme of taking the, the driving responsibility out of the driver's hands. Um, but we'll put, you know, we put a lot of safety of consideration in the Corvette, and everything that has to do uh, with your safety and accidents. We've got a lot of uh, safety features. And actually, inside General Motors, Corvette's not exempt from all the extra, you know, not federal, not global requirements, but General Motors has its own safety standards that are much, much higher than what's legally required, and all of those get applied to Corvette as well. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Okay, okay go to you now. We'll come back to you. Sorry, I didn't hear. Can you explain why one of the options mentions a gas guzzler in the past in 2018? One of the options mentions a gas guzzler in the past? There's a, well, a, C, a Z06 with the eight-speed automatic that's, that's a gas guzzler in the past. That's, that's all it is. That's the only one that gets it though. All the other ones were that normal set. It, it doesn't sound like it should be. It's a weird thing. It doesn't sound like it should be an option. If it's an option, I would just pick no. I don't want it. <laughs> but it's not really an option, but they, it's something they make us list that, you know, that option on the option list. That's why people need to There you go. Anyone else Okay, we'll come back to you now. One of the new cars out here has a manual transmission with pedal shift. What is the pedal shift? Actually, all. C7 Corvettes with manuals have paddles on the steering wheels, and that's to actuate the rev matching. Uh, it's a system that flips the throttle for you. It matches the engine speed to your road speed. It actually it's either on downshifts or upshifts. So um, some people don't want the car doing that for them. They want a traditional three-pedal manual, the way it's always been. You're responsible for matching the engine revs to your road speed. Plus, that's the default. That's the way the car starts. Uh, but if you want it to rip match, and there's times, even on the racetrack, uh, where you may really be desperate to have a really clean downshift, and uh, that system gives you that without the driver being responsible. So um, even our best drivers now at GM who spend their lives on track with manual transmission, they're the best heel towers you ever saw, they use the rev matching now uh, on track. So those paddles, 
Because if you drive it on the street, there's times where you just like to drive it yourself, and other times where it's handy to have a, a rev match feature. Um, like when I drive manual, I find that I'm turning it on and off depending on the traffic situation. And so that's why we made it very convenient and put it right on the steering wheel. Yeah, it's not tied to it. It's, it's always there. It's always accessible. You can do it no matter what other mode the car is in. Yes, sir. You want to talk about that? I, yeah, I talk, how many people saw Kai's presentation yesterday? A lot of people. Um, I'll just, I can't do it as well as he did, but to summarize, he went over a lot of information now uh, because of the new paint shop, as I say, the plant has a lot of rearrangement and general assembly, the body area, just talking about how it goes. And he makes it blunt and says, as we're rearranging all this uh, stuff, we're not really mapping out the ideal plant tour route yet. So it's just, you know, with, with all those changes happening, um, you could give us a time, you know, they don't have a time level yet when we'd be able to reassemble. That those type of activity. So yeah. So unfortunately, we don't have the so for 18. We don't have the tours. We don't have the engine bill program as well. As well. We do still have Eugene delivery though. So don't get to the Eugene delivery. And the bottom line is, um, we know people really like to tour. It's a big tourist destination in all of Kentucky. Even people who don't know or care that much about Corvettes that like to come into a manufacturing facility like that. So it is really popular, and we know there's a lot of pressure. It's really, you know, we'll bring it back as soon as we can, but the uh, safety, you know, the job one is getting the plant rearranged, getting the power in production, doing what that plant has to do. Uh, another consideration is safety of the tours. Like Carlin was saying, you've got a bunch of moving equipment around, uh, a lot of uncertainty as to what's going to happen when. So we want to get back to tours. It's just not the highest priority, and we don't want to pretend like it's going to be really quick that as soon as we bring the plant back up, that people can walk through. So that's why we put that bait out there. Other questions? Did you introduce the C7 you explain for safety reasons why if you were driving in track mode, you left it there, when you turned it on, it went back to the normal tour mode. But for safety reasons, have you considered if you stopped your driving question is why doesn't what we call it latch over an ignition cycle? Why does weather mode latch? Uh, we consider weather a, a somewhat unusual mode. Um, I've been here at the birthday bash and as soon as it rains, everybody takes off and finds a place for their car. You know, they don't want to leave it out in the rain. So we typically don't expect our customers to spend a lot of time uh, in bad weather. And so we don't want to really have the car compromised the way it's compromised in weather mode with people not really thinking about it. So we consider it a, a low use case. That's what we call a low use case mode. And that's why we revert to something that's more traditional, more standard. Yes, sir. Are you asking if blue calipers would be available as a, like a free flow option choice? Yeah, the, the blue calipers are really specially for this carbon 65 special edition right now, so they're not available as a free flow. It's kind of special for that car for this year. How many people would check the box for blue calipers if they could free express? I'm glad you would. Anybody else? Seriously? Seriously? Okay, we've got a scattering of hands. Okay, so that'd be your favorite, but people raise their hands. It's not that you think blue would be nice. It would be better than the other choices that we have. Okay. All right. Thanks. Well, we're always looking for uh, customer feedback, so you know that's why we come to events like this is to hear you guys and try to do. You know, we can't do everything for everybody. It's it's way too complicated. But when we have kind of a critical mass of people requesting something, uh, we really try to make that happen. Yes, sir. Uh, question is, have we 
Are you feeling intimidated by Chrysler's horsepower numbers? Uh, yeah, it looks like you know Chrysler discontinued Viper, and now it looks like um, they're looking for a different avenue to make headlines, and so they're headed to the dragster. You know, first the Hellcat, now the Demon. Um, when we talk about a car that comes out that has uh, the capability, uh, the horsepower, it's what we talk about is what comes out of the Bowling Green factory, not what you can accessorize. So the demon that you hear about is you know, the, the very impressive quarter mile times and 840 horsepower, that's not what comes out of the factory. You have to buy aftermarket performance accessories uh, to get that. So they're doing everything they can uh, to get those headlines. And, you know, we try to do very well-rounded cars. So, uh, you know, maybe we don't have the same horsepower numbers, part, partly, honestly, because uh, we're a very small car. You can't fit a big engine. The car would be very unbalanced if we put a big motor like that uh, in the front. You also wouldn't be able to see out of it. The hood would have to be so high. You wouldn't be able to see anything. So uh, we're trying to put well-rounded cars, and we don't really, uh, worry too much about what, what any other individual competitor has done. You know, if they put that miter motor in a Viper, you know, that was really competitive in other ways, that would probably make us stand up and take notice, but uh, to put it in big muscle cars, uh, it's not really a competitor for us. Yeah, I was at a uh, track day about three weeks ago now with my uh, Z51, and I spent way too much time stuck behind Hellcats. So, they, they just do not, well, you know, they, they are set up for the drag, to Ted's this point about being a well-rounded car, you know, they're set up for the drag strip, and that's about it. So, doing anything else, even on the streets, or certainly on a track, on a road course, they're kind of out of their element, for sure. I happen to be there at the time, and it was pretty comical to watch this guy who would not uh, pull over and let anybody by, because he was the fastest in the straightaway. He gets a straightaway, He'd fly down, you know, tons of noise, and they get to the next corner, and then there'd be a big parade behind him. Everybody would be lined up, <laughs> waiting for him to get around the corner, and he'd sort of saw his way around the corner, and then wide open throttle, like, you know, the tragedies. So, yeah, it's a completely different kind of car. It's, it really doesn't belong on a, any kind of road course track. It belongs on a drag strip. Okay. Yes, sir. I think the question was the, the vent hot where you can, yeah, that, that's available, that continues to be available. If you want, if you want a specific thing, you have to get it to us though before, obviously, you build it. So, yeah, that's still available for uh, ongoing. The question is, are we ever going to have a uh, Corvette Experience Center? Um, we're close to sitting in one right now. We have track right across the way. I mean, it's pretty cool. I think we're the only company in the world where you have a museum, the actual factory, and a track. Uh, so you can see that we're building something here. Uh, it's a long-term commitment. We don't have any specific plans around the uh, that experience center. They'd probably love to have you go to Spring Mountain. You know, that'd be an awesome way to experience the car. Go to Spring Mountain. Get the driver training, you get the experience of Corvettes there on the racetrack. Uh, it's an awesome program. Uh, but right now we don't have any plans to, to set something like that up here. And we have tried to do uh, drive events at certain, uh, we haven't done as much recently, but especially when this thing we came out, we did, a, we did a, quite a few uh, special driving events, get people in. But I think it is a good thing that we have to stay on going forward is, is, is more of the same things. But they are expensive. But yeah, it's good. I, I would just say that um, there, there is actually quite a bit of work going on uh, at GM regarding the overall customer experience for Corvette and how do we make sure that we're really upping our game there. And uh, we've seen things like the Porsche Experience Center. Um, yeah, I, would we be able to do something exactly like that? Don't really know, but it is something that um, we're looking at. And, uh, it really helps to hear that feedback from the record because it helps us go back and take that back and say, look, this is something customers really care about. 
Okay, any more questions? Question is, there's cars going around the Nurburgring. You are right. <laughs> there are cars going around the Nurburgring. Yes, back here. I think the question is, does the new paint shop offer more flexibility in terms of the kind of colors, the, the options? Um, I don't think we've announced anything yet, but we're trying to put in place um, you know, a more premium uh, process there that would let us do something more special than we're doing now. We don't have anything to announce uh, right now, but uh, it'll, it'll depend a lot on uh, customer poll, but we're the facility itself is capable of doing more than the current paint shop. Yes. Question is, uh, could we do, uh, this is actually related to the other one, so I'm asking about the, the brake dust that you get on performance brakes. Um, it's universal, it's around the world, it's the state of the art in uh, brake pads. It doesn't matter if it's on a Porsche, an Audi, or anything. Uh, if you have high performance brakes, uh, you get dust and that gets on the wheels. One easy solution is buy ceramics. You know, it's not cheap, but uh, it does uh, help tremendously uh, with the dust. Uh, the whole world is working on that exact problem. You know, how do you do high performance uh, brake pads um, and not have as much dust? Unfortunately, regulators are also making it more challenging. I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, several states have decreed that uh, you can't use copper in uh, brake pads, um, and so you know, if you don't think of copper as copper seems to me to be benign, but uh, they've decided they don't want to use copper in brake pads because it sloughs off as part of that that dust ends up in the water. I don't think we're a big source of that, but uh, there are regulations now on the books where we have to take copper out. And copper is a pretty big component of uh, brake pads. So this is an example of the kind of thing we face all the time, where we're trying to make the car better and better, and then some um, regulator somewhere in the world decides, well, we're going to take away something, uh, an option for you to try to make cars better. And actually, is a huge challenge uh, to replace copper or find something else in brake pads and even keep the performance that we have. So, um, Brake pads are kind of a black art. There's a kind of a witch's brew of materials in there to get the performance that they have. Uh, and like I said, everybody around the world is trying to uh, inter you know, invent a better mousetrap on, on brake pads. So uh, we recognize the issue. Uh, I'd love to not have to clean my wheels every day um, when I'm driving the cars with the performance pads on. Hey, so. Andy, um one thing you mentioned that ceramic brakes really helps eliminate that problem. You know what? For a limited time, as of right now, there's actually a $5,000 discount on Corvettes with ceramic brakes. So either uh, you know Z07 option or the Z06 with the J57 option. So if you're hurry, you're really interested in that. It's quite a good deal for that option. It is. In fact, if you think, I think if you look across. All manufacturers who offer ceramic brakes with that discount, it's the least expensive way to get into ceramic brakes in the world, which is a huge deal because it really is uh, very, very high technology. And we don't have the smallest ceramic brakes. We have about the biggest ceramic brakes. We've got uh, very nice size, very, very powerful, very capable brakes. Any more? Okay. It was a paint shop question, but I couldn't tell what the... Okay, that's related to the customization. Uh, paint a sample. Just curious, how many people uh, would like to paint a sample? I mean, you provide a sample color, and we paint it to match that color. How many people would like that? Okay. How many people would like it at $20,000? <laughs> I think Porsche charge is 10 or 12 or something to do that. So it looks like all the hands went there. You're staying up? 4,000? How many at 4,000? Really? 
Okay. Five. Those are five. <laughs> we're going to keep going up and doing one hand, and then we're going to do it. This is like Sarah Jackson all of a sudden. So I'd be curious, the people who raised their hand for a custom color, what color do you want that we don't have? Gold. <laughs> Orange. So some of you are, are talking about colors that we have had in our palette before. How, how, What do you say? Old flame orange. Okay. And um, you can tell color is obviously a very polarizing choice. Uh, it's it's difficult to um, give everybody what they want. You know, we spend a lot of time, you know, in Ryan in interior studio and in the exterior studio. It's extremely complicated uh, to figure out, you know, what are the best combinations of colors. We have tons of people that raise their hand at these events and say, you know, green. I heard a couple of people say green. Since I've been in Corvette, I think we've tried three or four greens. It's just bomb every time. Even where people said, oh, I love that color. In fact, we had a green when he introduced the C7. It looked like an awesome green. Uh, but it, the sales just dive to the point where, you know, if I have one or two percent, you're managing all the green parts. We paint a lot of them here in the paint shop, but we also buy a lot of them, so we have to keep things like mirrors in the inventory, and it just doesn't pencil as a, as a business case. So when colors taper off to zero, even though you might have a couple of people that are passionate about it, you just can't afford to keep it in the system. You're tying up you know, a big chunk of your paint capacity on a color that people hardly ever order. So uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult business situation for us. Maybe we should move on from color. Yes, sir. Wondering about five years. What does our warranty date say about any turbo? What durability improvements? Actually, uh, aside from supplier quality spills, just making the engine the same every time, there haven't really been a bunch of design changes. The small block is an uh, inherently robust engine. We built millions of them for trucks. We do a different version for Corvette but many of the engines are processed the same way, they, they meet the same standards, so we have a, a unique ability because the Corvette pushes the performance edge and the high speed and the track capability, those stresses on the engine, and the truckers, you know, they want high torque, long durability, towing capability, so the design team that has to put together the engine design has to consider those bookends of the use, use cases, we call them, the duty cycles. And so that bakes a lot of durability into the fundamental engine. That's why you see, you know, we saw a lot of crate motors. You see Corvette engines being used in all sorts of applications, not even non-automotive. Um, somebody was telling me they were in Florida and there was an offshore boat and they had three LT4s mounted vertically as outboard engines. Um, can imagine that three LT fours are along the back of the boat, so they find applications in, in, in lots of places just because it's, uh, it's extremely robust. Yeah. Yes. Uh, who was telling you that? You can put it in track mode. You want to make sure you're managing your shifts depending on the temperature, but yeah, you can put it in track mode. It just depends on the driver, the temperature, the track, there's a whole bunch of, it depends on the year. We made some upgrades this last year in the automatic on the, I assume you're talking co 6 Oh, you are? Oh, Z51? That hasn't been a big issue. Who said that? Who told you that? Name names. Okay, some guys said it. Did it overheat? Did it shut you down? Did you get a warning light or anything? But it didn't hit the red. 
So you're fine. Right, it'll send you a warning. If it's overheated, it'll, it'll like, help. There'll be a, a message in the driver information center. The shift patterns are different. That's the main reason. But you can shift it, as, you can, you can shift it manually and, and control exactly how you want it. Yes, sir? Any news on what? 2018 pricing. I told you, $45. <laughs> and he's not lying. I'm not lying. $45. 2018 went up $45. Inflation. <laughs> it's actually, that's, you know. Cross the line. Cross the line, $45. Line every day. Yeah. So that's actually a lot lower than inflation, so we're glad to be able to hold the, the price point and not let it spiral out of control. And that's going to go a long way towards uh, our retirement money, so thank you. <laughs> and the carbon 65 is 15000 And the carbon 65 is 15000 which uh, if you look at the actual content, um, there's a lot of very specific content. If you add up the individual prices of all that, you're actually getting a deal. Good morning. Yes, sir. Okay, it's another future product question. We, is this your first time here? <laughs> we never talk about future product. All we talk about is today's product, and we can't talk about future product. It's actually, we're not just being jerks about it. It's in our employment contract. We are not, you know, we can get fired uh, for that. Improving the format in the future. Yes, we will admit to that. We'll keep improving it, and uh, but you know, like I said before, we're here to you know talk to you guys about what you think where it needs the most improvement. So uh, we we go back to Michigan. We work on that. Yes, sir. Will format ever have compulsory stop-start technology to improve the economy? Question is, will format ever have stop-start technology? Um, you can see that getting pervasive across the industry. I talked about regulations before and the push to get, um, you know, minimize CO2 regulations. Um, for a lot of cars, start-stop is kind of no big deal. You can hardly hear the engine anyway. And so when it stops, you hardly notice. Um, for engines with a lot of character, like ours, it's very disconcerting. Uh, we've built cars and tried it out and it just feels like the engine stalled. Uh, I'd be curious, how many people think we should have start-stop on the program? So it's a mixed result. So, Porsche 911 has it. And it's, I've driven the car and it's, like I said, it's very disconcerting. Every time you come to a stop, it kind of, the engine dies and it's like, uh-oh, what happened? My, my, going to be able to pull away from the stoplight. So um, that's an example of where the herd is going that way. We're going to be trailing as far behind as we can. You know, I'm not going to say never, 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 but we all fight the good fight um, to not do stuff that we know you guys would absolutely detest. So that's, that's one threshold. If every customer would absolutely detest something, then we try to push back. Okay. Any other questions? Any other ways that the car would really make you hate it? <laughs> yes, sir. What do you want to see in the future? What do I want to see in the future? Start, stop. Is start stop is on the top of my list. <laughs> Same control. Exactly the same. 
It does. Do you have a do you have a, a, a set of yeah, you don't have you don't have eight way in your dashing machine. All right, make sure you check. If you don't have it, you have an extremely valuable car. <laughs> because we're only supposed to build one like that. It should have it should be a mirror image driver and passengers. It's the same though. All even on one else. The only thing that I'm one LT, you don't have the lumbar and the wings, but you still have eight way power. Every four has eight way power starting with one fourteen. So find one of us, go back and check your car. We'll be here all weekend. Find one of us if you really seem to have that. We'd love to look at it. <laughs> okay, you're on the corner. Two thousand well, we have Michelin here. Is Michelin still here? I talked to the Michelin guys about that. You want to answer the question? The question was, will we have uh, all season tires available for Z06 in 2018? So if I heard Lee right, end of this year, the wide by so Brandsport and CO6, there will be availability for Michelin. Okay, they're also going back to C6. Okay, in a month or two, right? So this summer. And this wasn't the oh, December? This wasn't the exact question, but I drove all winter uh, on CO6. I drove on CO6 all winter up in Michigan with the uh, Michelin uh, Alpine tires, the winter tires, it's awesome. No issues, it felt very confident, it worked great. So that's another option, you know, use those in the winter and switch back to the cup tires for the summer. Yes? We have a passionate plea for keeping engines in the front, at least on some models. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> you agree? All right. Some models. All right. In the back, yes. You stand up and ask that question. I think I heard you. You said you have the competition seats and you're saying even all the way up? Oh, you want them to go higher. Okay, I don't know. We might have in service like uh, little blocks to take the whole seat up just a little bit. Not not on top of the seat, but where the seat attaches to the floor. Can I ask you how tall you are? Five two? Okay. We we should double check and make sure, because I know a lot of ladies by two, so they, they can see you fine. So, grab, if, if you wouldn't mind grabbing me at some point, showing me your car, but to make sure that it is really going all the way. Any other questions? Yes. When does it get the bin? When the assembly process? Well, it's planned way, way early. I mean, we know the VIN number from before the first part comes into the plane. Pardon? Yes, we know what the VIN is. So they're all built with the expectation. All the parts come from really all around the world converge to that VIN number. Our order system sends it out. The, way, the place the actual VIN number is put on the car is about midway through uh, the process. And that's point of no return at the end. You can't back out of it from there. Yes, sir. One Turn signal function in the side mirrors. Um, so that's another example of something that um, a lot of cars have. Um, 
I guess how many people would like that? Turn signal function in the side mirror. So that's where you, it's called a side repeater, so you also get the flashing. You know, the plus side is that, you know, people up alongside of you can see it, you can see it. It makes the mirror a little bigger, it puts extra features, extra wiring going through the door. There's a bunch of downsides to it. Um, we try to keep our mirrors as compact as they can be. That's why we have uniquely, a lot of people don't do this, uh, we uniquely have domestic mirrors, so mirror size for domestic usage, and then export mirrors that are quite a bit bigger. It's an example of the regulations in this country don't match the regulations around the world. And if you want to do one that meets both regulations and mirrors, but really quite large. So we're always trying to keep the mirrors as small as, you know, it's a relatively small car. You don't want these big, you know, billboard mirrors on the side of it. It doesn't look good and you don't need them. So we uh, try to keep the mirror very compact. It's good for aerodynamics too. Mirrors cause drag, they also cause noise. So them being small is, is a really good thing from the, the driver's perspective. So. But we have heard that from uh, some folks along with the, the side blind zone that that would be a, a preference. You're talking about the EC mirror, electrochromatic mirror, and it's, a, it's pretty much the same reason that your uh, widescreen TV at home has a bezel around it. You actually have to, you know, there's liquid crystals across the face of it and you have to charge them. There's connections around the perimeter. So just like TVs, we're trying to make those thinner and smaller and thinner and smaller, but there still is a little bit of a, a band around there. Okay, last one. Yes, sir. The possibility of allowing the Our current rear view camera, which we talked about, is upgraded. It's actually a pretty nice upgrade uh, for this year. But its uh, angle of view is, is you know, focused on curves and it's down pretty low. Uh, the question, I don't know if everybody heard it, is uh, could we have that operate on a racetrack? We have a prohibition on showing moving images while the car is driving forward. That's why it blanks out uh, when you're going forward. You're talking about geofencing, so it'll only work when you're theoretically off-road. Uh, that's a fairly complex thing, and it's uh, not really in keeping with the requirements that we operate under. We can't have moving images while you're driving forward for driver distraction reasons. And that's General Motors. It's, I think it's actually a legal requirement, but there's other people like Tesla who go ahead and do it. Um, but that's an example of where they're doing something we think is actually kind of illegal, but they're selling it and they're, it's not getting enforced on them. So, you know, it's, I think it's kind of a cool idea. I, I'd like to see it, but I can understand the driver distraction side of it too. Okay, well I think we're gonna, we got another group coming, I think the race team's coming in uh, in a little while. So I appreciate all you guys coming up. Really appreciate the question. And we'll be here all weekend if there's any questions that didn't get uh, asked.